Okay, right, so shall I fire away? So if I um, go and share my screen, that's the next thing to do. And open up PowerPoint and start the slideshow. Hopefully that will do it. There we go. Right, excellent. So welcome everybody. So it's the first tag talk of 2021. We launched this uh, about seven, eight months ago now with a talk uh, which I gave on column capitals from around the world from photographs from my holidays. And I'm pleased to be launching the 2021 series. So we've had various talks on all sorts of subjects from individuals, members of TAG and what they work on, like Radek right, like Chanes talking about his landscape research. We've had discussions about ornament. And this year, it will be quite nice to introduce a few um, projects that maybe members of TAG or even other interested people have been involved in and can talk and share with other members and see what we all think of it and share our experiences. And uh, I'm sure the architects amongst you have some comments at the end because uh, there's a few controversial elements to this, which again, will come out as we as I talk about it. Mm -hmm. and if I was doing this at a crit at university, I know I'd be panned. So, you know, in the real world, you do things which you just wouldn't um, necessarily put into a architectural crit and expect to get away with it. So uh, anyway, some of those things I'll, I'll talk about. So this is a project that I first started with a client back in uh, 2009, I think it was, and it took a while to get through planning. It's in an area of outstanding natural beauty in the Cotswolds. It had a very large 1970s extension. So largely this was a replacement of a, an extension, but in a more sympathetic style. And then it's grown and grown. So as I mentioned in the little um, introduction online, this has been going on for sort of 10, 12 years, and I'm still working there doing little bits and pieces. And it's evolved over those years. This is our journey through those, those 10 years of its development from phase one, which we'll start off with. So this is a, a painting that the wife uh, commissioned for the husband, my clients, and as a birthday present, which shows it in its present form. So as you can see, it's in an idyllic Cotswold setting, rolling hills and pasture, lots of cows munching away and farmhouse complex various barns, stables, outbuildings. And hopefully from the painting, it looks like something natural, organic that's grown up over a couple of hundred years maybe. But if I go to the next slide, everything that's outlined in red is designed by me and is all within the last 10 years. So we've got, if I move my cursor, we've got the replacement wing of the, the main farmhouse this little thing here is the original circa 1800 farmhouse, which is like a two up, two down type thing with a few rear extensions. There was an original barn, which is there, which has had some additions and original stables with a hayloft. And then all these are new. So we've got new cart shed, new barn, a new um, building for staff, various additions to the, to the old barn. And of course the major wing to the house. And Funny enough, it kind of fooled me because I drove through the area one day going somewhere else and looked at this, this house with these gables and distance. Oh, isn't that a lovely old farmhouse? And I thought, hang on a minute, I designed that. Literally, I had no idea that it was mine until I, I looked closely and thought, hang on, <laughs> I recognise all those gables and windows. So in that case, it, it kind of did what I was intending it to do. So the brief was to extend it but not make it look as if you've come along with lots of money and built something brash and new and showing off. It's not something that looks like it's evolved organically over say 200 years of history as and when money came to the farm and, and, uh, and kind of it looks like a progression over centuries, uh, which is a game. And it's a game I learned from Raymond Eris actually. He was a brilliant mid-century architect, classical architect. He liked to build in what he called well, built-in history where he, things were not always quite as they seemed and looked like they might have um, evolved over a longer period than they really had. But this is just uh, a bit of context. This is actually the ecological planning drawing with all the bat measures and mitigation to put to axes and to roofs. But it does show on the, the left the original farm plan, which had a big concrete um, sort of portal framed open uh, Dutch barn there. These are the stables we looked at. This is the original house. This was the original 1970s wing. 
because it obviously had no money from 1800 through to 1970 and that's when someone quite wealthy came and built on something which at its of its day I'm sure they were very proud of but when my client bought it I thought we could do a bit better some old stables and the old barn and a couple of sheds and so on the right this was the replacement sort of wing or two wings and link to the main house and the new barn over here and oops that's my slides going a bit fast and then this was phase two which I'll show you slides of later on so this is coming out of the drive and this is the back of one of the open cart sheds that I designed as phase two and as you move through you come through to a courtyard and you begin to see the house ahead of you so we've got the new barn I designed over on the left uh, the old barn which had a few extensions on the right and then everything to the right of this line is new so that's the, the new replacement wing of the farmhouse with a new entrance and this bit here is the old historic part so there you are that's a comparison of before and after so broadly the new wing took the form uh, of the old one but in a much larger scale uh, but uh, again with a few alterations so this stable block was removed to enable you to have some sort of form of openness to the entrance and there was a new little gable tucked in between these two over on the old part and then you know broadly it took a similar form uh, but in, in slightly nicer materials and detailing I like to think. So moving along so on the bottom you can see the state the barn was in when my clients bought it, it had a 1970s conversion with some metal frame windows and infill and a garage put in a garage door and uh, it lost a lean to at some point which was reinstated and on this one I decided to go back to stone mullioned windows to, to make them sort of smaller and feel a bit more in keeping with the, the barn and it, it looked more like a converted barn that's been sympathetically done while the ones just had windows smashed through willy-nilly and then Opposite to this one, on the other side of the courtyard, is this new barn, which we'll look at in detail towards the end of this talk. So moving along, and then here again, there's another before and after shot. So I mentioned that the 1970s was when it got its big extension, and this was it, all designed as one piece. And, you know, internally, it had all the rooms you'd want. You had a large fireplace to the living room and kitchens and sculleries and everything you'd need. But again, it was, it was kind of the wrong stone for the area. It was a very iron rich stone so it turned incredibly orange as it weathered which it probably didn't look like when it was built but it just looked so alien in the landscape compared to the, the mellow honey coloured stone of the old house and then this is uh, all new all built in one phase by Sim and Co back in I guess 2010 to 12 ish going and again is deliberately conceived to look as if it might have grown up over various sort of periods of history so it's got various detailing that's stone and formal, the symmetrical gable, which is the actual stair hall behind. And then it's got rough cast render and lime wash on this wing. And hopefully has a sense of just sort of feeling like it's grown organically. And we'll look at some of the detailing and games that have been played to kind of achieve that um, goal as we go along. So a couple of close-ups of that west side of the building um, we've got an oak frame. This is actually an extension that happened only perhaps five, six years ago um, because the clients decided they didn't have a dining room because they didn't want one originally. And then they thought, actually, we do want a dining room. So it got tacked on. So that is a literal later organic growth, whereas the rest of it was built in one phase. And then I kind of want to highlight this little detail here of the little column capital. It's kind of an anti pilaster, really. Um, dissolves into the wall, which is kind of as a Lutchen's trick. It's also seen in the Renaissance and there these like Mannerist buildings. But again, it's a little theme that you'll see um, that cup crops up in different parts. It's just very subtle. There's just coins to the edge of the reveal and a little capital. So it's a simple, but vaguely classical. And then working way around a bit, you get to the other side, which has got the, what was at one point, the front of the original farmhouse has become the back, and it's been the back for centuries. Um, and then the new link, and again, just how different materials just break it down from being too monotonous. So you've got 
sash windows in this because you're sort of moving up a sort of gentrification from the old casement windows of the farmhouse. You've got rough cast render and then you've got coarse stonework and a string course because hierarchically that's sort of more important than that. So hopefully breaks it all down and stops it looking uh, like one mega extension because you could say it's a, a very small farmhouse tacked onto a very large extension rather than being a, a modest extension tacked onto a large farmhouse but hopefully it all kind of gels together and then there's another just slightly closer view so you can see a bit more of the detailing the, and one thing I will just start to highlight here is that you might just be able to see that the ridges are slightly wavy and I'll show you a highlighted um, close-up picture of that later and that was something that this is where I have to, have to fess up and say that if I was doing this at college I'd be shouted at. It's got a steel frame to the roof structure which you know in this day and age you're building in block work and cladding it with stone and you're building large span roofs it makes sense to use steel you haven't got exposed oak trusses up there or any kind of timber because there's no need you want the space so but then you end up with an incredibly rigid unrelenting ridge so i actually detailed and my friend jonathan helped with this a lot detailed different fairings to go on every single rafter so there were four different fairings, which were all different sizes. So that actually, by the time you got to the ridge, it kind of waved. So you'd imagine there'd be a, a, a dip here where there'd be a truss near the chimney or a, a ridge here where there'd be a truss there and then a dip there. So that's all complete artifice. And you might shout at me afterwards about then, you're welcome to, but I just couldn't cope with the idea of having soft, mellow Cotswold buildings and then just these ridges, which just give the game away. So that was uh, one of the first things I did to kind of make it uh, softer. And then we go right around the house, back to the courtyard elevation, which is where the, the entrance is. And because the entrance is in a corner, I kind of created this groin vaulted uh, entrance portico, well, porch, which has two aspects, one looking down this vista. So this view is looking up. And then this view is looking out from that porch looking down. And then as we move along, there's, what you're looking at now is entirely all the new build of the new wing. So you've got a little bit of the, the old farmhouse poked out here. And again, a whole range of materials. We've got lime wash on an uncoursed Cotswold stone here. This little element is the pantry and has a, a slurry coat of, of, of lime render. So you get the stone grinning through. So it's like a step up from the bare stone that's lime washed and this is actually just natural unfinished stone right through to the rough cast render, lime render on stonework, on, on block work. I was absolutely convinced that if we rendered onto block work, you get the risk of when it's wetted and dry during the rain and dry and soaked up, it would soak up and you track the joints of the regular blocks and that would just belies the modern construction. So although it is a block work core of cavity walls, it's then built over with a, a layer of stone and then it's rendered. So when the render, when there is a sacrificial material, it will fall off. I just can't imagine even if it's in hundred years time and we're all dead. I didn't want you know, it really re re sort of revealing uh, modern block work. So it will just do what old traditional rendered buildings will do. And again, you might see the wavy ridges there again, which you can see. Oh, so there. So I think that pretty much clearly shows it that um, it was orchestrated to have a ridge where a theoretical truss might be, but there isn't. And then when I went up on the scaffold to see the beautifully built ashlar chimneys, which were all incredibly crisp, I got them to hack all the corners off, which <laughs> initially they kind of thought, oh my God, we just built this so perfectly. They, they flush pointed all the joints, very fine. Um, all these arises were incredibly crisp and I thought they just stood out a mile so they got a saw, a mason saw and just scraped off all the edges and um, and uh, you know I think that was the right thing to do in this case. I wouldn't advocate it on every job on this particular place, this particular location. No one wanted it all to blend in. Uh, I feel that was the right call but you might disagree. So this shows Two comparative shots actually of the same gable, so under construction, the, the porch and entrance with its block work cavity wall. So you could actually throw up the building quite quickly, get the steel frame on the roof, felt and batten it. You had a sort of dry envelope, 
And then the stonework, which obviously is going to take ages, and especially waiting seasonally to do the, the lime render, because you can't do it through the winter. The temperature's got to be above, I don't know, five degrees. So there's no point to it. It was parked, but at least you could carry on with the inside with a, a watertight shell. And then the, the random rubble was brought up in any old fashion, because he knew it was going to get rendered. It was just about having a basis of stone to render on, which will give you the, the right look at the end. So, and this is a, a finished shot uh, looking out over the old part of the farmhouse in the distance. So moving along, so back to the entrance porch. So again, you can see the old house here. This little new gable was added in. And in some cases we used some reclaimed materials. So the roof, um, you know, the roof slates or the stone slates are all reclaimed and these coping stones were, but on the new build, all the ashlar was brand new. And this shot was taken about a month ago and you can see it's all weathering in quite nicely. So that's probably eight years old, which I think something like that. And all the stones beginning to, to weather in and soften and mellow. And I said earlier that um, things always changing. They decided they didn't really like the front door that was um, designed originally with its little studs. So a couple of years ago, I designed them an oak one, uh, which again, I think they could probably right. So again, none of the design is entirely me. The clients very, very influential in it, saying that they wanted the materials not to be on relating stone everywhere. They have mixtures of, of textures and finishes to create a hierarchy that came direct from the client. I mentioned my colleague Jonathan, who's here. He drew all the CAD drawings of the elevation. So again, after my initial sketches, he'd always improve upon them. And uh, so it's a very much a collaborative um, project really. And this shows the groin vault in construction. So you're looking down from the room above, this was, this was the arch that we were looking through down the path earlier. So you can see this timber centering for the arched reveals. And then this is when the actual whole groin vault was actually dropped in. So the final stone is kind of, I guess, four-sided keystone that locks the whole thing together. And then it was actually covered with in situ concrete. So in a way, although it's structural and it's holding itself up, to avoid it having any lateral thrusts on that corner column, uh, you know, it, it's got the concrete poured over, which basically just locks the whole thing together. And you could call that permanent formwork, really. And then going through the front door into the entrance hall. And we'll see a few shots of the inside. So I'll go through some of those. So immediately on the right, as you walk in, there's this dining room, which was an extension. So that was the original outside wall of the house. And you can see the thickness of it, uh, which is something that modern buildings often, because they don't need to have super thick walls. A, they're not necessarily always solid, they're often cavity walls. This one has got an inner leaf of, of block work, insulation, another leaf of block work, another leaf of stone and render. So that ends up, and I think that adds a lot to the sense of it being solid and feeling like it's got some age to it because, because modern structures are quite thin. I mean, even to the length of the, the depth of this arch going through the wall through from the hall into the dining room. It looks incredibly thick, but that's actually slightly cheap because there's some secret cupboards within the wall. But it's got all adding to this sense of something that perhaps might have evolved over, over centuries rather than built in modern sort of economical thicknesses of construction. And then one of the new fireplaces that was added in uh, at the end. Uh, again, with a bit of influence of Lutchens there, which again, this corner fireplace Lutchens has done it, I mean, it's been done over the centuries, but um, again, I, I'd often look back to Lutchens and John Soane's influence and uh, various little cues and nods that um, might, people might recognise as they look through. So moving into this uh, stair hall, so through this double arch and this corner fireplace, you turn right and then you get to the stairs. So this is a timber oak staircase. And I should mention Piers from Westenholz at this point, he's uh, the one who introduced me to the project. He runs an antique shop and does interior design and decorating and was very much influential in steering me towards being more rustic and making it more farmhousey. So every time I did a sketch for the stairs, he'd say, you know, beef up those spindles. So each of these spindles is four inches square, so 100 millimetres by 100 millimetres, the size of a normal mule post. But um, again, it's a farmhouse. He wants to look kind of chunky. It's not too delicate and refined. It wants to have some sort of sense of solidity. And uh, I think it does that. And, and then a massive ram's horn 
on there, which is a bit of a close up of. So and it's all in fumed oak. Um, Phil Morton might remember this story when the staircase got delayed for months and months and months. And we kept saying, well, what's gone wrong? And apparently there was a fire at the joiny work, so it actually got a bit more fume than it should have done. But luckily, most of it survived and they didn't have much more to, to remake than uh, they needed to. So uh, that's that. So going upstairs, <clears throat> again, quite a few quirky things. So it's not overly refined in terms of the spaces. So it has a sense that maybe this barrel vault has been knocked through. Maybe that's been added on. And so I allowed consciously for sort of quirky, sort of inarticulated junctions to happen. I mean, it's all resolved and I think resolved reasonably well, but not in a way that's all completely even and ordered so that you get a sense of, of history, even to the point that um, the window that's just here where this curtain is, that's here. It's designed, it couldn't actually be a full sash window. It couldn't even be a casement window with a vertical proportion because the roof adjacent comes right in, clips the sill there. So I thought, why not think of it as being someone's found an old Georgian sash window and just use one of the sliding sashes to make a casement. And there you have it. So it gives you a sort of a, sort of, a, sort of a sense of history. Even the client said, oh, tell me the story again about that. I want to tell my friends that that's there for a reason. It's not just a, a mistake which it kind of is actually, but I don't tell people that, but I have now. Anyway, and then uh, this panel wall, I'll just show you a bit of that. Um, it's actually got lots of things going on in it. So it's got linen cupboards at one end. This is a sort of secret door going up to the staircase, up to an attic crawl space that's just used for storage. And then a broom cupboard at the end. So I'll go back again. And then, yeah, so, but all quite, I, it's quite, I just like relish the detailing. For example, here, there's no actual frame. This door is rebated directly into that door. Um, as you can see here. So just, just clever sort of ways of working out how to make something look vaguely seamless and yet make them all operate in the way they need to. And kind of, it's always fun to get, get your teeth into detailing like that. And then just last one on the inside. This is the, the rendered link block between the sort of the top of the T of the, the new wing and the old house. And it's sort of transitional between the two parts. Again, it's sort of the sense that it might have happened in the 19th century. It's got a sort of beamed ceiling and upstairs it's got exposed trusses. Um, but I mean, obviously, not obviously, this is a very wide span. There is a steel beam in there. And effectively that is just cladding for a steel beam and it's got block and beam concrete floor construction. So, you know, none of that need be there, but it is. And I think it's better off for it and just makes it feel how you want it to feel. Um, so now we're gonna look onto the, um, the new barn. So this is the complete new building that uh, finishes off the third side of the courtyard that you're approaching. And to all intents and purposes is a Cotswold barn. And certainly in terms of what it has to do in terms of dressing that space, that's the form it's in. So looking from the old barn opposite to the new barn, you know, it picks up on cues, these little triangular vents are details that are picked up on the old barn. So they were kind of um, mirrored across on the other side and actually little windows into the building. Again, you can see the wavy, the wavy roof. And there really is a truss here, an oak truss, which we'll see in a minute. And there is really an oak truss there, but of course it's got a rigid new, ridge plate which is straight so this is all I'm afraid <laughs> a cheat and you'll see a bit of that later on and then as you work around it's kind of an iceberg building because it's on a hill obviously going back you can see it's it's got a, a, a normal proportion of a sort of modest barn on that side but the ground slopes away about at least a meter and a half two meters down so by the time you get round to the back of it it's quite tall and you can see something else is going on here that it's not just a barn and in fact, of course, is the swimming pool. So it has, this is actually an all the green oak construction. Uh, it's got two main trusses. The inspiration was Bradford and Aidan Tithe Barn, sorry, going back, which is 1330, I believe. So that was uh, where I got the idea to kind of create this kind of curve, which kind of seamlessly links the side and echoes the arch here. And there's a bit of an ecclesiastical kind of reference too, that this might be the nave with one side aisle going down on the left. And 
it was designed to be open actually so you'd swim through under this arch and see the truss that you can see behind the glass here and none of this was supposed to be there but the client said I need a gym where's the gym going to go so I said okay I'll try and squeeze a gym in so that became a mezzanine uh, and got added in later on and you know it all adds to the character of it and the sort of sense of, of, of evolution and uh, and the history and in a few more shots just around Jimmy looking at the staircase that goes up in the corner to go up to the gym and you might if you're eagle-eyed you'll notice in the shot on the left there's sliding folding doors here on the line of this side aisle and they realized after living in it for a few years that there wasn't really any space to sit around which was their own fault because the pool was supposed to end here and they said oh they want a little paddling pool for the kids so could they extend it into here which we did the building was already half built by then and then it's got to have nowhere, nowhere to sit so there's a little glazed extension that pushes out here to give them a sort of social space to sit in so again even this building has evolved over its uh, ten-year life and I said I'd show you this is one of Jonathan Norris's drawings fabulous set for the, the pool building and there's three things I can point out here so one we've talked about is the, the wavy ridges so you can see that's amply illustrated here with the fairing pieces that vary in height to give you that. And then there's some other interesting things. The engineers get involved, of course, and I go back in. They um, said that these 18 inch columns couldn't be solid stone because the compressive um, strength of that stone wasn't sufficient to hold up the masonry above. So they said, would it be all right to have a concrete column? You can just stick stone on all four sides. They said, no, that's not happening. So each bit of stone has a hollowed out core, is all stacked up one above the other, and then reinforcement bars put down and concrete boards. So they are permanent, permanent shattering, so they are effectively a concrete column with a stone cladding, but the stone is all in one piece, so there are no joints, so you don't belie the fact it's actually um, a composite structure. And the same is true of these giant oak beams. These are, again, 18 inches square, um, this is now a gym, obviously, with a floor structure, and the engineer said that span of six metres, whatever it is, there'll be too much bounce. So they wanted to have two halves of an oak beam with a flitch plate in between. They said, well, we can't do that. We've got to have one big oak beam, which then got sawed down the middle to about three quarters of its depth. And a big stainless steel T plate was then bolted in to give it that uh, rigidity. And then in the same theme to these hollow columns, uh, originally the engineers designed a tie bar going across to relieve any lateral thrust from these arches because there's no buttressing either end. And the client said, oh, my kids are just gonna be loving that. They'll be swinging off it, <laughs> playing Tarzan. We can't have that. So in the end, each of these voussoirs is actually a three-sided piece of stone in a U shape and then concrete has been cast inside it, which again, you can see in this next slide. So this and this is actually part of the same stone. That's one stone hollowed out. That's another stone hollowed out. And you can see the rebar is beginning to go in and then the concrete is pulled into it. So that actually holds all the arches together and stops any lateral thrust. Um, and you can see the beginnings of the big arch across the pool at the end, which became the mezzanine for the pool. So that's sort of some giant Roman <laughs> kind of bit of engineering. And then the next shot will show again with the stone, again, U-shaped stones placed in and the reinforcement coming along. And that's the stage when the concrete being shuttered and poured to kind of clamp the whole thing together. And then the green oak trusses and purlins all going in here in a little view up looking at those, those two. And then the final shot of the pool, which is the mezzanine uh, gym. Again, just showing the sort of crack timbers and, and the detailing of the oak. And uh, this was gently sandblasted just to raise the grain a, a bit to kind of um, take away the newness, which again, you know, you can shoot me for it, but um, I just felt, you know, the arises need to be a bit softer just to have a sort of sense of, of age rather than looking sort of new and crisp and, and shiny. And then we're going to move on just before we end um, to look at a couple of outbuildings. So this is one of the last phases, it was built by a local builder after Sim had, um, had finished the main phase one. And this is a staff accommodation wing with storage. And you know, again, I was talking about built-in history and how things are made to look as if they might have evolved. It was all built as a piece, but 
I thought it'd be quite nice. You've got the stairs and the entrance to the flat coming up here from the courtyard. It'd be quite nice to imagine that you'd had six bays of cart shed and you've just come in and knocked out some of the doors and infilled them with windows, just to give you a sense of history. So again, that's a little game going on there. And opposite that, a simple building. First slide we showed going up the drive, you saw the back wall of this, um, just a very simple open, open cart shed for, um, for vehicles. And then the final cherry on the cake was going to be a summer house in the kitchen garden. So that was the very, the very bottom, that was my initial sketch of a Cotswold, little loggia open to the elements. It then developed to have a little fireplace you could keep warm and sit there in the chilly evenings. And then it evolved into having fully glazed openings, became pyramidal. Jonathan invented these uh, octagonal windows, which looked rather smart, and enormous fireplace, all going to be in Cotswold slates, stone slates. Again, you've got the little uh, capitals grinning out from the wall with no actual pilaster, just one central column. And it was going so well. Um, this is where it got to when I last took my photographs of it, up to wall plate, getting ready to build the roof. And you can see the little details here, which is a theme that runs through the whole site and was just waiting to get its roof. And then next time I went, it all gone and it'd been replaced by a timber little shed, which someone else designed. And I don't know how it happened. The clients and I never talk about it. <laughs> um, but it's just one of those things you just sometimes don't always get your own way, but you know, there you go. It's up and down. And to end you with a, a sort of better thing, you know, we're, as far as me and the clients go, I consider them naked to do me a friend, not just an architect. It's been a journey over 10 years and I'm sure I'll be still working for them in another 10 years. So it's been a very happy, enjoyable process. And I hope you've enjoyed watching this talk and uh, I'm sure you'll have some questions. So feel free to fire away. I've got one question, Simon. It's John here. Um, oh, hello, John. I'm not on um, video because um, of uh, a meeting. Sorry. That's right. Uh, see the upstairs landing. Um, I mean, the whole thing's beautiful, by the way. It's just absolutely amazing. Oh, thank upstairs you. landing where you have all the cupboards, right? Mm. Were there two beams that um, met without a column somewhere? Uh, uh, well, there is. There's a kind of, yeah, do you want to go back to the... Um, uh, yeah, I'll go back to it. How you handled that, you know, just what... I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. There's, uh, yeah, and it's, again, it's very simple. You could, I mean, I was, it was crying out to have a column and an and a anti-pilaster at either end, really. But again, I was always trying to hold back. Yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, what do I do now? Do I press the back button? Um, how do I do that? Oh, that's the end. There we go. Yeah, let's go zoom back. Let get you busy. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, this is kind of like quite an ambitious span. I mean, actually, this is very, there's a bit of a fish eye, so it's not quite as um, bad no. as it, it looks really. But yeah, there's just an implied something going on there, mm -hmm. but um, nothing much. And then there's a downstand arch beam because there's a step up. This is actually in a lower, this has got a gable and a, and a ridge going uh, on mm. axis with the entrance hall, and then, then the rest of the building is going up to direction. So the roofs actually kind of clash up there and change level. Mm. But um, yeah, now you could you could easily architect it up a lot more. And this was about sort of pairing things back a bit and implying stuff without actually having it. It's a bit like the theme of the, the little capital without a pilaster. You just you just know that's what it means. But you don't need to have it to actually no. basically a style in terms of its um concept. Is it, is it more with the two beams that are you know ah, so these ones. Yeah. Yeah. There's a I mean that what there's into there's actually a kind of coffer running all the way along here because this mm -hmm. this there's a sort of space which um, balances the space that the cupboards that occupy on the other side to keep the symmetry because right. the vault is obviously centered on the gable outside. Right. And you're right, there is a very long coffer going along here. I mean, I actually lost a battle with the clients on the ceiling of the landing below because I wanted to have a, a beam expressed because there is a steel beam across here and a trimmer going across there. And I wanted that expressed on the ceiling as you know, a boxed in beam. And they decided that that would actually reduce the headroom. I mean, not to a point that it was below two meters, it was still perfectly generous where you've got stairs under this beam. And they, we had an argument, you know, we nearly fell out about it. The husband was saying, 
I want a flat ceiling. I want to just see it all spill out onto the thing. I said, I want to have a beam to express the fact it's actually made. And he's saying, well, look, the steel's up there. You don't need it. And I, you know, I can't win the argument. It's again, it's, yeah. it's saying, yeah, am I being authentic? Am I trying to make it just look and feel like it should feel? And again, I'm, I'm not going to say it's 100%, you know, succeeded on that front. Um, but no, you know, you're right. Yeah, that's well spotted. No, no, just the whole thing is beautiful. And, oh, thank um, you. Um, very jealous. Oh, well, I mean, this is the biggest thing. I mean, I, I, I hope it's not my swan song because it's my first and only big job um, of my entire life. But um, no, to was one to have. I mean, if I did die tomorrow, I'd get rid of my bus. I, I think I'd die reasonably happy. So yeah. Yeah, no, I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Good. Um, Simon, hi, Francis. Hello, Francis. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good. That was really fascinating and really it's really beautiful project and amazing attention to detail. Oh, um, I, I was just amazed that you managed to persuade this client who uh, demolished your very sweet summer house <laughs> to, um, to build a stone wall and then render over the top. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'd seen it once had, before. Had it? Yeah, I, I'd seen it once before. I think it was some, um, I mean, funny enough, the guy who called John Byrne, who did all the lime render, I was discussing it with him. I said, look, I've convinced them to spend more money on a rendered part of the building than on a, and a, a stone face part of the building because, you know, render is seen now as being a cheap material because you can throw it up in anything, the cheapest concrete pop-up, mm. slap your render on it, job done. And I'd seen somewhere years before, I'm not, not sure it was a lime rendered building, it was probably cement rendered, where you could just see every single 215 mil course mm. of block heard, running uh, through. And yeah. in lime, I thought, I just thought, I had a hunch, you know, it's going to be more absorbent. It's going to take longer to dry out. I, I just couldn't bear that. So again, although, so their client said, I'd quite like some of this to be rendered. And I said, it won't be any cheaper. And they said, that's fine. You know, you do what you think's right. So, um, and having spoken to John Byrne, who did the render, he said, yeah, I'm afraid I've done a job with lime render and it's all grinned through and I'm really embarrassed about it. So I thought, oh, phew. Mm. I think I'm off the hook. But presumably um, you could have got quite bad stone because you were going to cover it. I yeah, mean, it was funny enough, because he bought a whole load of stone, I mean, mostly new new um, stone that was uh, bought from a local quarry. But of course, you end up with loads, you end up with piles of bits because you've been napping away for months. Yes. It will tell us the yeah. stories about the napping. That, you know, all the, all the junk... You can see there actually that you know it's, it's lost a little tiny bit, you know. Right. It, so rather than throw it away or go to landfill, it was kind of a byproduct of the building in a way anyway, and okay. uh, it made the walls obviously an extra six inches thick. Uh, mm. That's how thick the stone was, but um, that's not a bad thing. And luckily, my, <laughs> like I say, my client didn't um, balk at the, the fact it was actually costing them more to to render part of it than, than leave it as stone. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a curious relationship. In that you've got the power to do that, yet they they demolish your summer house without telling you. I know. Well, I I, I fear. I mean, I haven't talked much about the landscape. I mean, the landscape is absolutely beautiful. It was largely conceived by a combination of Mary Keane and Pitt Morrison. Um, oh, yeah. Many of you might know Pitt Morrison's been working yeah, 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 trees yeah. a lot recently. I think he's gone off on his own. And they were they were amazing. They've done a, 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 in terms of putting this building into its context. You cannot fault it. Um, and I don't think it was them, but somebody who was advising them um, said, oh, this is just too grand, um, this is a modest, and they're probably right, it is a modest farm sort of estate with a kitchen garden, and it had this sort of rather, you know, grand summer house in the corner of it, so they obviously got persuaded that uh, it was just too big for its own boots, and um, I think they're wrong. <laughs> But anyway, but we haven't fallen out about it. We just don't talk about it. And, um, you know, we are good friends. And, you know, it's just one of those things. But, um, yeah, it just shows how strong the relationship is that um, we do have a... I mean, probably now, if we look back at it, if it comes to that, it might have had a bit more faith and gone with it. But um, I think they were just getting a bit fearful that things were just going, getting a bit mm. too... Because they, 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 the beauty of these plants are they just didn't want anyone to go there and think... Oh gosh, they got loads of money and they've spent it all on a, on a nice big extension. And look at me, and so yeah, it's all part of that whole ethos, which you know is is worked very well, I think, to to make it. I cool. came in a little late, so it was a sim project, was it? It was absolutely, yeah. No, Phil's here. He was. Oh, uh, right. So I met Phil Morton, 
on this job. Uh, I'd like to say he accounted me amongst my friends now, and uh, you know he was he was brilliant on the job. Actually, I mean it's it's the best built thing that I've, I've ever worked on. I, going back now, you, you can't snag it. There's no faults. You know it's it's uh, it's a shame Sim have gone, but um, I, I mean I think I've, most of their staff have gone on to other firms, so they kind of that whole you know experience and and, and craftsmanship still still there but uh, not in its uh, in sim form but um yeah no it's um beautifully built and who were the i suppose it's all sim in-house joiners and stones. yeah so per Pershaw, they had their own joineries which um fantastic place they had they bought the old um veneering machine from jaguar which you know jaguar cars when you want to veneer on a curved dash they've got mm. this inflatable balloon that sort of presses down to sort of stick right they had all yeah. their amazing equipment. They could they could make anything. They and they did all the joinery in the whole house. Mm. Um, yeah, exquisite. Simon, so I'm, I'm doing um, kind of a similar timber trust thing at the moment. Um, I was just wondering what company you used for. Uh, yeah, I I can't remember them offhand. They were brilliant. I'd highly recommend them. There's about two or three. Um, Sorry, Green Oak it, Company. Where was it? Car Carpenter Green Oak. Carpenter Green Oak. That's exactly yeah. it. Well done, Phil. Thanks for that. <laughs> so yeah, assuming they're still going, haven't been a victim of COVID or anything. Highly recommend them. Um, I mean, they, they got involved. I mean, apart from me designing the main trusses, which were based on Bradford on Avon, when I was at the Structural Engineers called BTA, um, James Birdwood, I went to the loo and came back and said, "Oh, we've come up with an idea for the trust for the gym." I thought. That's great. So I can't really claim much design credit for it. But, yeah, it just shows how a team, you know, everyone brings their own experience to it. And you can't know everything. And it's, it's just be open to kind of what other experienced people know and can add to it. And uh, it's very much a collaborative thing, the whole thing. Hi, man. Yes. Hi. Hello, Scott. Hi, hi, hi. You're, you're right. Um, very good. That was excellent. So I, I don't think you should, you know, philosophically beat yourself up too much about the you know the sense of I know what some people would call artifice that mm. you know you brought to the scheme because actually you know things like you know you're designing for context and you've explained very well you know why you did those things in terms mm. of the you know, external expression of the building and then you know issues like um, you know using stonework to to make concrete form work for you know some of the other structure of course mm. the Romans did that all the time and Raphael Manea, uh, you know, he he played on that a lot when he was doing his projects, you know, that he was building in a tradi tradition, you know, an honored tradition of, you know, you know, rubble stone, and then you you clad the outside of the structure with, mm. you know, the finished material. So, a lot of those things are are you know, you know, very um very forgivable, and I, I you know I, I think they're they they and uh, they achieve what you tried to do here, which was settle this thing. You know, in, in its place, which is is just really well done. You know, it's well, really thank you. That's uh, yeah. that's very reassuring. I mean, I'm I'm all for using. I mean, it's a bit like the, the philosophical arguments about rebuilding Notre Dame in in Paris. About do you put it back exactly as it is? Because they didn't have the benefit of steel frame back yeah. then. Yeah. And of course, if they did, they'd have done it in steel. And if you're building it now, I mean, but I, obviously, there's a whole different argument about wanting to, even if it's all new because they have a record of it, they completely scan the thing, they can put it back, you can keep the craftsmanship alive, that obviously makes sense. But here, there makes no sense not to do it with a steel frame and concrete block. And so, yeah, no, I, I can stand up and justify it. I just know I'd be ripped to shreds at a crypt if I was at architecture school, but we all know real life isn't like that, thankfully. I'd like to ask a question if that's all right. I, I, I agree with, uh, it's Doug here. Um, Hi, Doug. I, Hi, um, I agree entirely with uh, Scott uh, Scott Master about that. It's uh, uh, the, uh, the the sort of uh, illusion of upholding things is perfectly fine. Um, it's carried on in many many disciplines, and it's a it's a great tradition. Perfectly all right. Um, I've got a kind of status question about the. Uh, the sort of overall composition um okay. you use really quite sort of honorific details you know you're drawing on luchens quite properly you know it's a great source to draw from um it, does it go beyond that at all are you sort of using luchenesque proportional systems in the overall layout of the uh, scheme as it were do, 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 is it beyond the kind of details do we see a, a sort of uh, greater resolution of uh, sort of 
this kind of Vitruvian form of design at all? Sure, that's an interesting question. Um, no, it's a short answer because funny enough, I, I went to um, see um, what's it called, Hamilton's um, mausoleum up in Highgate, and asked him, "Is there any proportional system going in?" Because that's a perfect building to ask that question. He said, mm. "No, I just do it by eye and whatever looks right." And I'm, I'm afraid I'm doing the same. Everything about this project has mm. been instinctive and just intuitive, and what I feel looks right and I suppose if you then analyze it I think whatever you know whether it's a one to root two proportion whatever if you know a human being looks at something and they've got some sense of proportion and I probably if you analyzed it retrospectively you probably would find some proportions and harmony and balance amongst it but again it's all as for me as a sort of artist stroke architect um, it's very much all done by what I think that window should be, where it should be, what size it should be, and proportion. And, you know, hopefully, if you've got a good eye, it all comes out looking really balanced. I mean, there's certain bits which are a bit yeah. jaunty, and maybe if I did it now, I'd have changed the proportions a little bit. But in a way, slight jauntiness and slightly uncomfortable things actually is exactly what this building is all about. I mean, I... Well, it, it's very much the craftsman tradition, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. It is about that kind of adaptability and judging it by eye, which is absolutely marvellous. Yeah, wonderful. And it's also kind of quite an arts and crafts plan. I mean, I'm not one... Mm. I have done a formal symmetrical country house mm. and it creates its own disciplines. You know, you might have a bog behind a huge window that's the same size as the one for the study opposite. And you think, well, that's not mm, right, is yeah. it? But, you know, it's, that's how it is. With the this. old problem, isn't it? <laughs> So or the staircase goes up behind a window. So we're here that you're actually liberated, although it's actually more difficult because everything can be where it wants to be spatially. The arrangement of the rooms just works incredibly well because, you know, everything is where it needs to be. And the fact that pantry is a little excrescence on the outside is played to its advantage because you can just do what you like. You haven't got to hide it away behind some yeah. wall, like well, th this of course is the advantage of sort of the vernacular it gives you this freedom mm. and flexibility of functionalist planning doesn't it absolutely uh, th that you can put things where they need to be so you, you seem yes. to have exploited this very well it's delightful thank you well, well thank you very much that's very nice to hear thank you great well any other questions yes yeah. yeah. um, hello simon my oh. name's renee killian dawson um i'm an interior designer and so my, I'm very interested in, in um, your collaboration here. It is a beautiful group of buildings. Thank you. Um, but I'm curious, were your clients um, British or were they? Yeah, absolutely, very English. So yeah, they, they, I met them in London uh, where they had a townhouse, which I did a, a, a bit of work in their attic. And then, you know, suddenly a year later, they said, all right, we, we bought a, a country farmhouse estate. Would you like to? work with us on, on, on that so um yeah they're, they're very english and I, in a way that, that probably shows in a way because they're not the sort of people that want to particularly show off um their relative wealth and actually, so yeah, yeah perfect clients i i thought the opposite actually oh. <laughs> um, i thought they were rather more brave than most of our well uh, i suppose that's better it, it's certainly unusual um, I remember meeting the planners who initially said, oh, we don't want these rich London types coming around and throwing their money around and building these big brush country houses everywhere. Um, and I thought, well, my clients don't want to do that. And they thought, oh, that's unusual. So yeah, you're right. I mean, it is uncommon. And, um, and, and, and I'm very grateful that they, they were. Um, as much as it's nice to design a, a full square country house in the middle of nowhere from scratch, which um, again, several of us have done. Uh, it's just it, it, it's it's more of a challenge. I mean, as we were discussing, though, know, because you've got no constraint about formality or symmetry, it's slightly more daunting because you think, gosh, you know, it won't just naturally turn out pretty unless you sort of somehow get to grip with the plan, the elevations, um, the whole. You know, you've got the whole different hierarchy of, of finishes and different elements. You know, there's a lot more to to play around with and. It could either work or not work. So yeah, it's um no, very successful buildings. Thank you. And, Thank um, you very much. Just in, in in terms of what were your biggest surprises throughout the build phase? Because you know there are always surprises. Um. Yeah. I mean, there were. I mean, there were various points where um, there was a disconnect between. 
the setting out of the steel roof structure and the gables where, and, and funny enough, it was because I couldn't use CAD at the time. So I had two different people doing CAD drawings. And the only reason it came to light because I actually physically checked in a calculator every single measurement on the steel setting out drawing and then discovered because my two GAD cars have been working off two different things. Neither of them had picked up that one was working to a slightly different setting out to the other. So um, it could have gone terribly wrong because the steel work, if it got fabricated to the wrong dimensions, would mean it would have to be remade. So it, it really brought home just how important, you know, coordinating every single detail of the, the, the drawing package, construction drawings really was. So that was kind of a, I thought it was a surprise. It was a bit of a sort of scary moment when you thought, gosh, you know, you've really got to be on top of these things. Um, so that was a kind of learning curve. But um, otherwise, I mean, I suppose weather, um, that was a, a huge factor. I mean, Phil remembered the snow. I, I haven't got the photographs of when there was, a, there was a basement under the main wing. So that it was built with just excavating the entire crater in the hillside, building a concrete box and then backfilling it. And there was snow and people couldn't get to site and it was miserable. And, you know, the stonemason was, you know, there on site and trying to do samples and thinking, gosh, we're all, you know, what are we doing this for? So just really the hardship of just actually, you know, it's not all fun and games in the, the sunshine, as you can see on the right of the screen, you know, it, it really can really throw things out and you're at the mercy of elements. And, and uh, so that was, that sort of brought things back to home. It was the first site where, you know, frozen to the core you know, in blizzards, you thought, gosh, did I really sign up for this? But, um, but no, we all battled through. And, it, and I think all of us on it, all the builders, you know, all the team, well, most of them anyway, all just sort of clubbed together and it became a kind of a joint venture to all want to kind of make it work. And it was a very happy experience. I can't think of actually a happier time on a building site in, in my whole career. Well, um, I think those I experiences say. make up for all the heartache that's sort of endemic mm. in what we mm. all do. Well, <laughs> quite, yeah, it's not all, all fun, is it? Um, but uh, these sort of things do make it worthwhile because you do, you know, you know some of what we all do is, is, is you know, quite arduous. And, um, you know, this, when it does all come together, and I mean, even last month when I went there, so my client said, oh, I was going to write to you and just say, because in lockdown, they've ended up moving to this permanently. And said, I just enjoy what you've done for us every day. And then I don't write that because I can just tell you to your face. And it was the nicest thing anyone's ever said. Um, clients don't always kind of, you know, tell you what you mean to them. And um, yeah. so it makes it all worthwhile. Don't say anything unless they have a complaint. So well done. <laughs> That's very true. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Very good. Well, um, if there are no more questions, we Thank can... You. I don't, Simon, I have... Oh, hi, uh, Anne. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Can hear me. Well, um, uh, partially, uh, congratulations for um, uh, achieving what is... Uh, I always sort of complain because I aim for the same thing, which is a building that looks like it's always been there. Um, and it's always... There's a sort of a strange down after you finish the project when it just looks as if it's always been there and everyone else just assumes it's easy and it's actually mm. the hardest thing to do um and to get a especially if you're working in a kind of vernacular it's really really difficult and most people i mean i do take i do enjoy it when they think it's a renovation um rather than a new build but it's um the funniest thing that sometimes and i don't know what your experience was um getting getting builders to do what I call a bad job, you know, but, but not really, not bad so that it looks deplorable, but just looks like it's, it, it's, it's kind of got a bit of artistic flair to it. Um, Absolutely. I mean, one of the big things, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, the biggest compliment I find is that nobody knows what I've done anywhere on any building because they all think it's always been there. Yeah, and no one recognise you because uh, you can't say, oh, look at me, I've been a clever architect. Um, but it is the biggest compliment that I could have is that someone just thinks, oh, I didn't even notice that was there. It just fits in. So fitting in is, is, is the biggest compliment. Again. But on this one, again, yeah, everyone wants to build everything crisp and sharp and perfect. So the big thing on this job was there was a hierarchy of um, arises for plaster work. So, for example, so I did a drawing that for the old part of the house here that um, there were no, no, no chance of using a corner bead in any plaster or any stock bead. So it was all hand rounded off. So the arises 
in the old house were designed to be, you know, on average, you know, kind of 15 mil, but uneven. So they weren't to be true or vertical, which goes against all British standards of building, you know, yeah. you know, flatness of two millimeters and a meter out the window. Don't worry about it. And for God's sake, don't make a sharp corner anywhere. And then when you move through into the, the new wing, there were parts where you'd have a, a straight window reveal, which wasn't lined with say timber paneling and architraves, but was plastered. But that wanted to be a little bit more wrought. So it might be a say five mil radius, or it might have a dowel, like a 12 or 18 mil dowel on the corner and a little quirked detail. And then you might have ones which were really sort of straight and formal as in the drawing which I didn't show, which has proper paneled reveals. So there was a whole hierarchy within that of how to not build as straight as you would. And it all went down the pecking order down to the old part of the house where, again, that was all very, very wibbly wobbly. And um, you have to sort of unteach people to do things bad. A bit like the chimneys hacking off the poor masons to actually, you know, to preserve and transport all the stone perfectly with all these crisp irises and then for me to go and hack them all off. Yeah. I don't know what they said. It is all, about, it's all know, about that, that level of detail. Um, that, that sort of made, made everyone sort of think you've lost your marbles at the end of the Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, but no, it's something yeah, it's... that people just don't see. And I think that, that that's sort of the biggest problem that I find. They just don't see the problem. Mm. They think that you're being eccentric. Mm. Uh, but it's all, it's the, it's the collection of all those tiny, um, tiny errors that uh, actually make it look as if it's, it is timeless. And, and it is really, really difficult to do. Mm. No, you're absolutely right. No, it is, yeah, it's... Um... But no, I'm glad, glad you yeah, followed the same ethos. Yeah. Thank you. Any more for any more? I mean, afterwards, if anyone's got any questions afterwards they haven't um, asked or think about later, you can always contact us via our email on the website or by Instagram. So feel free. And uh, we'll post this on our YouTube channel anyway, and then you can um, get in touch after that if you you have any other questions on anything that you've seen tonight or we've talked about and um just like to thank everybody for coming i think this year bodes well i think in terms of our tag talks it's one good thing to come out of coronavirus i think it's just all of the sort of zoom lectures and the fact it's encouraged us all to, to mix more and and talk more and no matter where we are in the country or the world we can all come together so you know i think it's a, it's a rather exciting prospect and next month, we've got our award ceremony, which has been postponed from last year and is going to be virtual. So we're going to attempt to give out all our awards next month, which um, you might have seen posted on, uh, on our social media for the tag design competition for students and also measure drawings. And we have a few other awards up our sleeves as well, which we're going to do. And then um, if anyone here who's a member thinks, oh, I could talk about a project I've done, no matter what scale, whether it's a small extension that's exquisitely wrought or you know some large new building from scratch we'd be love to see more of this sort of talk i think so i've, I've done this as a sort of uh, a scapegoat first uh, go at getting others to hopefully do more and look forward to all of those so thank you everybody and see you again at the next one hopefully thank you very much simon, thank you very much, simon. wonderful thank you, simon. Thank, you. thank you thank you so much well done. Well done. thank you simon, Thanks, simon. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.